I always like to give a little history with what we know. And I want you to understand the ability for us, thank you, to minister in other places in this world comes as a direct result of the fact that in this country we can still preach the gospel. And God has blessed this nation with a prosperity that is unheard of anywhere in the world. Um, I was going to preach a message against communism today. Ronald Reagan was right. He was a fierce anti-communist. And he saw, even in his day, the uprising of communism and the effects of communism in our colleges and universities. As governor of California, he was very well aware of what they were teaching those young people. And that's why the protest went on in California. That was about the last time that California ever voted for a Republican to be governor. Because if you remember, after Reagan was... Nasty, stinking Jerry Brown. And I always heard as a young man, as a teenager, just J.R.'s age, the California Supreme Court ruling on this. California Supreme Court ruling on that. They were, they were establishing a new set of laws in this country is what they were doing. They were a liberal, progressive Supreme Court in California, and they meant to change the nation into a socialist, communist nation. But I'm not going to preach that today. But historically, historically, even though the great, Brother George, the great denominations got their start in Europe, in England, the Netherlands, they found fertile ground when they were seated in America. And they grew. And every town in America, when they built a town, they built a church. And then they built another church. And then they built a saloon. And then they built another church. And then God started sending young men and young women from those churches to go to foreign lands to preach the gospel. And that's how it still is, I believe, today. And it's funny because I've heard that in some of these third world countries where these guys are going, they're very well funded. But the people of those lands, they're not dumb. And they've said repeatedly, we don't need your money. What we need is for you to send somebody over that knows what the Bible says. That's what we need in our nation. We need to know what God said. And uh, thank God, Michael. God bless you and your grandmother. Your grandmother told you one morning, called you and said, Michael, God's going to answer a prayer for you today. And Michael said, okay, Grandma. He's learned that if she says God said something, then God said something. So he came over that day. Him and Alicia ganged up on me and said, will you please let me start a radio station in Kenya? I said, fine, get off my back. I did. And uh, that's probably the greatest blessing I think we've ever had in this church. What God has done over there through here still remains and I hope it stands as a legacy long after we're gone. Somebody say amen. Take your Bible, turn to that verse, Job chapter 19, verse 29. I got, you know me, I got several verses, so have your Bible open and ready to turn to each one of them. I kept running through my mind uh, Friday and Saturday that some things that I would preach today and uh, was trying to build some ideas and get some ideas and just seemed like it wasn't going anywhere. I did pray and ask God, God, you, it's your message. 
You're going to have to preach it. It's your people. It's your church. So you preach what you want to preach, Father, Holy Ghost. And we was going home yesterday after a little barbecue, and God laid this on my heart. We carry inside of this church, there are men with guns. Now, that might scare you if I told you what men had the guns. But there are people in this room that I've authorized to carry and to use deadly force if necessary to protect the people inside this building. We have measures in place. By the way, I've always been wanting to say this, but have, just haven't said it. Uh, if I say, gun, get down, do exactly what I said. Don't try to run. These pews are your protection. There's, you're sitting on wood. Wood will slow bullets down. And... Um, so that's your emergency plan, lesson plan for today. Um, and the men or the people who are carrying guns, they will stand. And I want you to think about this. These people have volunteered to be targets for you. They volunteered to give their life so that you're protected. So that, I'll use this word, so that you are saved. I want you to think about that. Because our plan is, and I won't say what, but we've talked about it, our plan is to actually bring in more firepower. To protect the people that are here. And I mean it. The people who will stand. Do so. To be a target. For the rest of you. To be saved. The enemy fire will then be aimed. Here I'm probably talking some of the guys out of it. They're going I don't want to do this. There goes Roy. He's leaving. Roy said I didn't sign up for this. This chicken outfit. I want you to look up on the screen and we'll read this verse together. And I want you to pay attention to what it means. Job 19 verse 29. Be ye afraid of the sword. For wrath bringeth the punishments of the sword. That you may know there is a judgment. I was going to, I forgot all about this. I was going to put a picture up after this one of the St. Louis lawyer standing out in front of his house with his AR-15 and his crazy-eyed wife with her pistol. <laughs> I'd be more afraid of her than him, amen. But listen to me, listen to me. The St. Louis prosecutor, Kim Gardner, who doesn't know a law from recess, has said she will go after them to the fullest extent that the Missouri law allows her, while she allows her own people to be slaughtered and killed. Even in favor of destroying the last city jail that they've got. They call it the workhouse. And I was watching on the news this morning. They mean to tear that down. My question is, I wonder who's going to sell that property to who. I guarantee you that's what's behind it. Guarantee you. They want, somebody's wanting to buy that property. They want to destroy And the guy who runs the county jail, somebody said, they got plenty of room in the county jail. They're just not using it. And the guy who runs the county jail said, excuse me, we keep extra space in this jail to separate gang Gang members from other gang members that they hate and to separate the females from the males. Don't be stupid. But here's the issue with the sword. A man that carries a sword 
carries it so that he never has to use it. You understand that concept? Look at that verse again. Be ye afraid of the sword. For wrath bringeth punishments of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. And I don't mind telling people, I'm not going to tell them who's carrying and what they're carrying and what we've got planned. I'm just telling everybody who would think to do harm. And I, get, and I know there's people who think to do harm to this church. They want to see this church destroyed. And I'm just letting those people know right now that if you come in here, we're not going to be puppies or fish in a barrel. I want you to know right now that if you come in this church meaning harm, you should know that there is a judgment awaiting for you when you walk through the door. Now I want you to think about what that sword represents. I've taught this millions of times and I'm going to continue to teach it. Where there is authority, there is protection. And those in this country who seek to remove authority, we know because of what happened in Seattle. When you remove authority, you remove protection. Did you see the video? The father of the 16-year-old child who was shot down in cold blood in the chop zone in Seattle because no police protection. The father with tears in his eyes pleading for justice to be done. His boy got slaughtered in a place where there was no law and there was no sword. Cubby, when the police are around, do people commit crimes and right in front of the police? Because the police carry guns. And everybody knows it. Now I want you to take that principle then and apply it physically, spiritually. What is the sword that I'm referring to? The Bible. I love Marines. I could never be one. I, could ne I ain't got it in me. But I love the uniform. They got the best uniform of anybody in the military. And by the way, Marines are honored to carry a sword, but never an umbrella for a sissy president. You know what I'm talking about? Obama. He, he came out with the ambassador, I think of Turkey or something like that, in the Rose Garden, and he compelled the Marines that stood by him as an honor guard to hold an umbrella. Even, he was even moving the guy's arm because he wasn't holding it right because he didn't want to get his hair wet. And you can look on the Marines' face. They're standing there holding an umbrella like a stupid sissy butler. And their, their commanding officer said that was an absolute disgrace for those men to be compelled to do something like that. Let's pray. Father, I love my country. You know that. You've, I believe you've put that in me. God, it, why would I hate the land of my nativity? Why would I hate my own people? You've called me like you called Jeremiah to preach to the nations, but you've also called me like you've called Ezekiel to preach to my own people. And Lord, I love my people. And I love this land. I love this country. I love the good guys. I love the good guys. The men of our history. The men and women, Lord, who stood in honor of this country. And the men who came from literally nothing. Men who were former slaves. Men who were outcasts. Men who came from other places who were impoverished. 
who rose up to huge success. That is, that is America. That's what, that's what liberty can do for somebody. It'll bless them for their labor, for their work, for their effort, for their ideas, for their ingenuity, for their industriousness. It'll bless them. And that's why I love this country. Because, Father, one day I was nothing. I was nothing. And God, you bless me so that I could be a blessing to others. An example to young people. And Father, I'm thankful for that. I'm not boasting of that. I'm thankful for it. So Father, I pray, dear God, you remind us all of the sword. And that it stands to protect the freedoms and the liberties that we have here. It stands to protect the Word of God. It is the Word of God that protects our faith. It protects our rights, protects our freedoms, it protects our families, it'll watch over our homes. It'll keep us, Father, from the snares and the traps of the enemy. And I pray, dear God, that we would always be given leaders who would exalt the sword. Bless this country, bless this preaching, Father. Help me to preach it, I pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. I don't have this picture on the screen, but do you remember a few weeks ago when the president decided to walk out of the White House and some people just called it a ridiculous photo op, but he walks out in front of the church where they were protesting. What did he raise up into the air as they took his picture? Do you know what he, you know what he was doing? You understand what he was, what he was getting across? He's telling the world, this is our country. This is the sword that protects the freedoms and the liberties that we have here. It is the rod and the staff of authority. And it gives me great comfort to know that I've got a president and a leader who will stand for the word of God and stand for a strong military and actually give them bullets to use in their guns. Look at what, a, uh, this is not Abraham Lincoln. Who is this? Thanks for helping me remember. Here's what Ben Franklin said. The very fame of our strength and readiness would be a means of discouraging our enemies. For tis a wise and true saying that one sword often keeps another in the scabbard. The scabbard is what holds it. So a man standing with a ready sword is the one who is keeping the enemies from pulling their sword out. Think of all these westerns that us older guys, I'm starting to like these westerns now. Like my dad did. He sat all day and watched him westerns from the 50s and 60s and gun smoke and all them, right? I'm starting to watch them now. I'm turning into my dad. Can't wait to retire, so just sit and watch them all day. One guy with a pistol out and ready prevents a whole gang from pulling theirs out, doesn't it? And look at what he said again. The very fame of our strength and readiness would be a means of discouraging our enemies. For tis a wise and true saying that one sword often keeps another one in the scabbard. Let me read this. This was from November, uh, September 30th, 1648. The New England Synod of Churches. By the way, I have a book written by a man from St. Louis, Bill Federer. Called, uh, it used to be called America's God and Country. You guys know who I'm talking about? It, it, now it's called the American Quotations. But it's got a list of famous quotations that our forefathers, founding fathers, men in American history said about God and the Bible. This is from the New England Synod of Churches, September 30th, 1648. Define the nature of civil government and the function of civil magistrates and the duties of citizens. Duties of citizens. Watch this. Number one, God, supreme Lord and King of all the world, hath ordained civil magistrates to be under him 
over the people for his own glory and the public good. And to this end hath armed them with the power of the sword for the defense and, and encouragement of them that do well and for the punishment of evildoers. You see, when I go to the gas station every morning and there is a De Jefferson County deputy sheriff in there, I don't go, oh, I'm not going in there. There's a cop in there. Why would I be afraid? I walk in there, I don't approach them because you don't do that to cops. I keep their space, but I walk by them and I say, sir, thank you for your service. And if they're, if they're a county deputy, I always say, I'm Holly Cook's favorite uncle. She's my niece. She's a Jefferson, they call him Brown Clown. She's a Jefferson County deputy sheriff. She's on the major case squad. You don't want to run into her. Be, be doing bad. She'll thump you or she'll kill you. Amen? I'm not afraid of these guys. I want them in that gas station while I'm in there. And that's what he said. That's what they said. To this end, they've armed them with the power of the sword for the defense and encouragement of them that do well and for the punishment of evildoers. Then, here's a book called The Life of George Washington written by Mason Locke Weems. And he tells of a story that he heard in the winter of 77. Now, that's not 1977. That's 1777. In the winter of 1777, while Washington, with the American army, lay encamped at Valley Forge, a certain good old friend of the respectable family of the name of Potts, if I mistake not, had occasion to pass through the woods near headquarters. Treading his way along the venerable grove, suddenly he heard the sound of a human voice. Roy, you got to hear this. Which, as he advanced, increased on his ear, and at length, became like the voice of one speaking much in earnest. As he approached the spot with a cautious step, whom should he behold in a dark natural bower of ancient oak but the commander-in-chief of the American armies on his knees at prayer? Motionless, with surprise, the friend Potts continued on the place till the general, having ended his devotions, arose... And listen to this. And with the countenance of an angel serenity, retired to headquarters. Friend Potts then went home and on entering his parlor, called out to his wife, Sarah, my dear, all's well, all's well. George Washington will yet prevail. What's the matter, Isaac? Replied she. Thee seems moved. Well, if I seem moved, Tis no more than what I am. I had this day seen what I never expected. Thee knows that I always thought that the sword and the gospel utterly inconsistent. And that no man could be a soldier and a Christian at the same time. But George Washington has this day convinced me of my mistake. Somebody say amen. And there is a famous painting of George Washington next to his horse on his knee in prayer. That man was a Christian praying man. And it were, if it were not for George Washington, we would have never had this country. He prayed his way to victory at Valley Forge. That's what it means. In Genesis chapter 3, we have an example. Turn your Bibles there. We have an example. God gives us pictures. So that we understand his ways. Is God against the sword? Is God against using the sword? Is God against violence? He is against violence to the innocent. But God himself will use the most extreme violence against those who are guilty. Doubt it not. And who's he going to send in the last days when the days when the Antichrist rises up and takes power over the earth? Who is he going to send? Jesus himself doing what? Riding on a horse. What's that horse about? War. You go, hey, study horses in the Bible. You know why God picked a horse? 
The Bible explains to you, horses are not afraid in the day of battle. Horses do not turn back and run the other way in the day of battle. So I often wondered, why did God pick a horse? Why is Jesus coming back on a horse? Why, did, why didn't he pick a dolphin or a whale? Shark? Flying lion? Why didn't he pick that? He picked a horse because horses don't turn back. They charge ahead in the day of battle. So in Genesis chapter 3, watch this. God is showing the necessity of the sword. What happens prior to this event in Genesis chapter 3? What happens in Genesis chapter 3? Sin entered into the world. Because sin entered into the world, God now sends a message to mankind that things that are precious, things that are noble, things that are of beautiful adornment, things that we love and value, and things that are honest and right must be guarded. Do you say amen to that? Jim, why did your son decide to join the army? Why didn't he go into civil service? Why didn't he, be, why didn't he become a cook at McDonald's? To serve. To serve, to stand with a deadly weapon, holding it out so that no one approaches our nation. And it works. Because under eight years of Obama, they just about destroyed every way for us to protect ourselves in this country. Do you believe that? You should, because you should not vote for Biden or allow him to take office. Genesis 3, verse 22. So here's what God did. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims. And a flaming what? Which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So here is a, here's an angel. And a flaming sword. And what is that sword for? That sword is present so that nobody approaches the tree of life. God's going to protect what is precious, what is a beautiful adornment, what is honest, what is true, what is, uh, what is sacred. God's going to protect it. And I want you to contemplate this in your mind. I want you to get this in your heart. Where the sword is, there will be protection. Put the sword away, and the enemy will move in instantly. You believe the Bible? Say amen. amen. And see, watch this. I've got it under the category, the sword brandished and not used. That St. Louis lawyer standing out in front of his house, did he ever fire a bullet? Did he even, I know his crazy wife, had it pointed at everybody. She obviously needs some gun training. Amen. But he had it right. He had his finger out here like this. You look at the pictures. He had his finger out right th like this. But he had a gun in his hand. Now why was he standing out there with a gun? It was to keep that crowd. He said it. A stupid Cuomo on CNN said, How does it feel to be the face of bigotry in this country. I want to slap that guy in the nose, right? Just bam, right here on the nose. Idiot. And the lawyer came right back with him. He said, you are, you are dead wrong. That's insulting. He said, I watched crowds just like that burn down half of my city. And he said, I wasn't going to let them come in and destroy what I'd worked 34 years to build. All he did was stand there. And that was enough to turn evil away. Yeah, yeah, believe this Bible. God sent that sword down 
and made it to be seen so that it would never have to be used. Do you think that the men, I'm not even going to point the finger at them. Do you think the men in this church who will stand up if somebody comes in here, do you think those men actually want to kill somebody? I don't. I would never want to take somebody's life. But don't come in my church. Don't walk in here meaning harm. Don't do it. Because if we have to, we will. And I'm letting the whole world know that this church is surrounded by men who will stand up and be ready. And that in itself, I believe, has kept us safe all of this time. Is that what you believe? In fact, turn to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm going to give you examples of the same. I'm going, to, I'm going to repeat the same thing over again about 20 times this morning. Then I'm going to get on the road. I ain't kidding you. I'm leaving. I'm headed out. I'm moving on. I'm packed. We got the camper ready. I'm going to put on a pair of old clothes. And I'm going to get on the road driving. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 16. And it came to pass from that time forth. See, they're building. They're trying to rebuild the wall around the Jerusalem. Why'd they need a wall? Because they got enemies. Who are they going to put on the wall? Men with arrows. Don't you come near. I'll shoot you dead. You ought to hear Reg Kelly preach something like this. He preaches it way better than me. He says, don't come near my house. You'll see guns sticking out of every window in the house. And he's probably got them too. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 16, it came to pass from that time forth that half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half of them did what? Held spears, shields, and bows and haberdashers. One, two, three, four. Isn't that something? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The gospel, protection, authority, the spiritual awareness. Because we have principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places that are coming after us every day. Amen? Amen! And they which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens, with those that laid it, every one with his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand that held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so built it, and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. So they laid bricks with one hand, held a sword with the other. And then had half of the men standing there with arrows, spears, Habergens, probably swords. What was the purpose? Was it so that they would fight? No, it's so that they wouldn't have to. So I want you to think about it. Why did they want the police out of the chop zone? So they do all the drugs they want to and kill the people that they wanted to kill. And the guys, go, the guys are probably going to get away with it because the crime scene now is ruined. And by the way, only cops would do this. The cops knew when they took back over the chop zone, they knew that if they did it at 5 a.m. that none of those hippies would be awake. Amen! They're all strung out! And they was, it's just like sheep pushing them out. They was all too messed up in the head to fight back. Cops know that stuff. Amen. But that was the purpose of it. The sword brandished, but not used. And I want you to get this picture now. Because you see, if the devils that attack you know that you're carrying the sword... They won't mess with you. Does that sound about right? If you'll brandish the sword by reading it, meditating on it, quoting it, the devils know not to come near. They know. Here's another example, Ezekiel 32, verse 10. 
Yea, I will make many people amazed at thee, and their king shall be horribly afraid for thee. When I shall, here God said the word, when I shall brandish my sword before them, and they shall tremble at every moment, every man for his own life, in the day of thy fall. Look at here. God said, I'm going to hold a sword right up their nose. I'm going to point it at them. And God said, they're going to tremble every moment. Why? Because I'm, I'm, they know I'm going to kill them. They know I mean business. I guarantee you, we'd make the papers if we've had three guys standing out with AR-15s out in the front of the church. Just standing there. What are y'all doing? What are you wanting to ask for? Who are you? What are you doing here? You want to come in and get saved? You want to come in here and get religion? We got a house full of it. But if you come in here, you want to mess with us, you got to get through us first. They'll never show up. Shoot. I'll just tell them Roy's out in the front. Roy, all the time you've been out in the front, has anybody ever messed with anybody's cars out here? See? And we'll only give him one bullet. Amen. But who wants that one bullet? The sword brandished but not used. Numbers 22, 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary. This is Balaam. You remember the story of Balaam? Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and it went into the field. Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, and, and a wall being on this side and a wall being on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall, crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And in verse 30, And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. And the, ass, the donkey's saying, have I ever done anything stupid like this in all the years you've been riding me? And Balaam said, no. Now, I don't know why Balaam didn't go. Why are you talking to me? <laughs> and he just answered him. Uh, uh, no. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And look at what he did. He bowed down his head, fell on his face. Because he saw the sword. Now he knows why the donkey wasn't going that way. The donkey was smarter than he was. And when he sees the angel of the Lord standing there with a sword in his hand, he's going, I'm not going over there either. Look at Joshua chapter 5. Turn there. Oh, I love this. This is Jesus, by the way. He's the captain of the host. Listen, there ain't no other captain, is there? They're just Jesus. Captain means chief. Big, big, the big guy. Now, I know in the American military, captain is a sort of a middle rank. It's your generals that are the top rank. But in God's army, the captain's it. Think of the cap, the head. Joshua 5, 13, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Notice the pictures. God repeatedly got, he's trying to show you this. The sword's not in the scabbard. does no good there. Just you said, well, I believe the Bible. I believe the King James. That doesn't do stink when the army of Satan comes against you at night. When the devils are ready to chop you up in pieces, you're laying there in your bed. Pull your sword out. Make them leave. Amen? Years ago, a guy that comes to this church every now and then, he'd give me a Mossberg... Pump, 12-gauge shotgun with a tactical grip. And he said, Mike, all you got to do is go. <laughs> and he said, if they're smart, they'll leave. So, Michael, do you remember this? The neighbors across the street were over there having a little drug party. And we heard a bunch of screaming and yelling. And they come outside Alicia grabbed my 12-gauge pump and went, Shh, sh. she looked like that lady in St. Louis going. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> oh, there stood over man against him with a sword drawn in his hand. Joshua, went, by the way, we called the cops on those people that night. They had drugs everywhere. They were so high. 
we could hear them flushing. Because I told them, the cops are coming. They both ran back inside. Flush, flush, flush. And he said, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from, shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Joshua, guess who that was? And you know what happened? Look at your Bible. Look in your Bible. What's the next chapter? The walls of Jericho fell. Who do you think made them fall? The man with the sword in his hand. Amen. I'm almost done. Am I? Well, there's Gideon, the sword of the Lord. You study, study Judges 7 when I get done out of here. And by the way, that's a beautiful story. What? How did the Israelites fight? They didn't. Brother George, 300 of them stood with a lamp in one hand and a sword in the other. And they said, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And the enemy went, ah! and they fled, killed one another. It was the sword and the light. Psalm 149, verse 5, To let the saints be joyful in glory, let them sing alone, aloud upon their beds, let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hand, to execute vengeance upon the heathen, and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains, and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, His honor have all His saints, praise you the Lord. God's going to let us come back riding on a horse behind Jesus with swords in our hands. Isaiah 66, 16, For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Now turn to Romans 13. Cubby, thank you for your service. Not only to your community, but every time you attend church, that man, I know him, he stands ready. I said to him one day, I said, Cubby, he was, he was in uniform. I said, now, Officer Cubby, I'm letting you know right now, some of the guys in this church are carrying guns. And I said, if you ever get a call to come over here, send an ambulance, because the guy's going to need it. And you know what he told me? Don't let him live. He'll come back on you. Evil does return, doesn't it? He'll bring seven more light. Now, he didn't say this. I'm mad at this. He'll bring seven more. Because that's what Jesus said. Isn't, he said. isn't that what he said? When an unclean spirit leaves, what does he bring back with him? Seven more. In Pastor Kelly's town of Norwood... The Baptist church, a man came in that church and shot several people in that church, shot at the pastor, missed him. And the men in that church jumped him and held him down. And I called Reg and asked him about that. He said, it's true, every bit of it. And I said, Reg, we've all decided that we wouldn't jump somebody with a gun in our church. And Reg said, that's what I told my people. He said, there'd be blood everywhere. It'd be a slaughter. Now that kind of talk, I don't even like saying it. But whatever's in the physical, you always think the spiritual realm. And when you're laying in your bed at night and you've got principalities and powers sawing you in half, tearing you apart, tearing your home apart, tearing your marriage apart, tearing your kids up. Pull the sword out of the scabbard. It's time. It's time to stand up and fight. I'll tell you what, I saw J.R. stand up while I was singing. That's a young man who loves his country. And the rest of you, God bless you. Because we're not, we're not going to let this country fall without us standing first. 
Romans 13, 4, he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must need to be subject not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. See, the police work on your conscience, don't they? That's why when Officer Cubby would pull somebody over and he sees them shaking as they're pulling out their driver's license. What is that, Cubby? Something wrong. That's their conscience going, I hope he doesn't look at my car. Here's my, here's my, uh, this is not your ID. This is somebody else's. Oh, no. And he knows something's wrong. But about a year ago, I got pulled over. Missouri State Highway Patrol, young man. And as soon as I saw him, I knew, I knew I'd got busted. I pulled over. I pulled out my driver's license and my concealed carry card. That's what you're supposed to do. And I handed it to him. I wasn't shaking. Officer, appreciate you. And he looked at that and he looked at my concealed carry card and here's what he said do you have your weapon with you I said it's back here in my backpack he said okay I'm not worried about it he knew by looking at me that my conscience was clear I wasn't hiding drugs I wasn't hiding anything illegal in that car he could tell by looking at me your conscience wherefore for conscience sake be subject to the man who carries the sword. Because God has ordained the sword to be the thing that protects this nation. And I wanted to do backflips and front flips and all kinds of cartwheels when I heard that President Trump signed an executive order that said anybody who messes with any kind of monument in this country, minimum 10 years, federal prison. I'm not big on statues. I am big on let's remember who we are and where we came from. That's what I'm big about. That man means to protect the people of this country. And I stand for him and I'm not ashamed of it. You don't have to ask me who I'm voting for. And when it comes to our families and our faith, not only in this country, but in our private lives. If you don't hold the sword, you're going to lose. You've, all, you've lost the battle already. Let the devils of hell know that you're holding the sword. And you won't have to worry about anything else. I've seen God move. I've done what God said. I've had days where I've fasted and prayed. I've seen God do miracles. I've seen devils leave. I've felt such heavy presence. I just wanted to just drive off and leave. And I had no idea. It's crazy headed. Didn't know where I was going. All of a sudden, boom, that was gone. Because I pulled the sword out. And they left. And I'm telling you, it works. It works because God ordained it to work that way.